and I'm Dan Williams and I work uh, at Life Technologies here in Austin and I'm going to talk about um, how we use Python at Life Technologies to do our uh, bioinformatics work. So what I'll tell you about, I'll tell you a little bit about Life Tech and a little about me and then just take you all through a tour of the things we've done with Python at Life Tech. Um, you know, covering RNA sequencing, Bayesian methods, uh, MapReduce, survey analysis, and Django. So first about Life Technologies, it's a large biotech company, um, 11,000 employees worldwide, and it's publicly traded, and it's a major player in several biotech markets like uh, RNA sequencing, RNA interference, animal and food pathogen testing, et cetera. About me, I'm a bioinformatician. I've been one for five years at Life Tech. Before that, I was a government analyst. Um, and in that government analyst role, I started using Python to uh, wrap SPSS scripts, um, which made SP the statistical package SPSS run a lot, uh, run, worked a lot better that way, just being able to wrap code in Python. So I was, that's when I started using Python as a way to command and control other software packages. Um, I began my scientific career using MATLAB, though, doing uh, dynamics and control, and then moved to R when my uh, work became more statistical. These days, I've mostly replaced R with Python. Um, I still use R for obscure things like survival regressions, um, but for the most part, I use Python for everything. So now I'm going to take you through this tour that I uh, promised. So first, I was going to talk about sequencing analysis. And here is a 10,000, maybe 10 million foot view of uh, RNA sequencing. So you can imagine this bar across the top is a RNA molecule in a sample. And I've just labeled the nucleotides just so that, uh, just to provide context. To, to se sequence this and derive what these uh, nucleotides are, you divide up this um, sample RNA molecule into indicated by these. And these are copied in the lab over and over and over again. So there's hundreds of thousands of copies of them. Then th these molecules are stuck on a sequencing machine, and the sequencing machine produces what we call reads, which are just uh, strings of these four characters. And with the reads, we can map it to a known, uh, known RNA. So this was a sample RNA. We can map it to a known RNA and figure out, so if you imagine a reference RNA molecule starting at base zero through nucleotide, say 6,000 or so on this axis, and the number of these reads that map to a given nucleotide, for example, 10,000 map to this nucleotide, and 60,000 of these reads map to that nucleotide. You can get a, you can use it, analysis like this to examine how your sample might differ from a reference. This is the same plot I showed on the last uh, slide. But what we use Python for in sequencing is we want to explain why there's peaks and valleys, you know, and, ideal sequencing experiment, it'd be all uniform. Um, but we don't, so we don't know why that happens. So we'll often do uh, correlation studies with stats, the stats models to ask what about this region here and this region here makes it lowly um, covered, whereas what about this makes it high? And uh, we even use time series methods like Granger causality to compare a motif in the RNA sequence versus the uh, output. Um, we also use clustering, so if we have multiple runs that, um, you know, tens of, or hundreds of these runs, and we want to see how they uh, cluster, how, how the runs are similar, we, we use uh, cluster.hierarchy. And, of course, to plot a lot of things, we use matplotlib. So here's another example of just using stats models. We, uh, we spike in controls of known concentration. These are RNA molecules of known concentration that we put into the sequencing experiment. And if we see them on the other side with the right concentrations, which in this case is a, a, a linear curve, then we know this, the experiment is successful. So, you know, we'll use Python to do these uh, linear models. So then I was going to talk about Bayesian analysis with PyMC. Um, there's a poster on PyMC. I'm hoping you all got to take a look at that. Um, so. This is sort of a, this is a different kind of task than sequencing. Suppose we have a series of short DNA sequences which correspond to uh, known outcomes. So this one corresponds to outcome Y, let's call it disease state Y. This one correl correlates with disease state X. 
and we want to train a classifier that can take any arbitrary sequence and tell you which one it's in. So a common strategy is to look for motifs in the sequences and then correlate those motifs to the outcomes. For example, uh, the probability of observing an A after a T in outcome X might be greater than the probability of observing a nucleotide A after a nucleotide T in outcome Y. And if we know these probabilities, we can uh, create all kinds of scoring models to, to separate um, those two classes. So to obtain these probabilities, I kind of combined my prior knowledge about this particular domain with a small example data set using uh, Bayesian estimation. And PyMC makes this really easy. So uh, just to walk through PyMC, with four lines of code, I specify the uh, prior knowledge. Um, this is basically I pulled these numbers out of my head based on my knowledge of this uh, domain and specified that in, in these quick four lines of PyMC code. Then I added in some experimental data. I only added in seven data points, um, but that's just giving it a NumPy array. I then connected the data with the prior distribution and said that the, the posterior distribution I want is categorical. Again, this is a very small amount of code. And out comes the uh, posterior distribution that I that mixes my prior knowledge with the experimental data. And again, this is a very short lines of code and this gives the new probability vector. And just for the, so just to show that this um, strategy does something, over here I have a classifier built purely on my prior knowledge. And over here I have a classifier built with the, the Bayesian inference output, my prior knowledge plus the seven data points. And you can see that this one separates the two sets a little bit better than that one. And if you add more data points, it gets much, the separation's much wider. So next I'll talk about map, how we use MapReduce um, with Disco. Um, Can I ask you yeah, sure. Um, how'd you pick that uh, classifier? How did I pick it? Yeah, like why'd you use Bayesian instead of like... Uh, to see if I could do it. That, that was why. It seems like it should SVM. We've, we've used SVMs for other things. Um, I did it just because I was learning Bayesian methods and saw an opportunity to apply it. I haven't yet. Um, that's something I want to get into, though. So, so MapReduce is a framework written in Python. In fact, you, probably you all caught the talk yesterday. It's a framework written in Python for doing a map reduce. And basically, you can specify your map and reduce operations as Python functions and then chain them together. Um, so the way I applied this to a biological problem is each mRNA molecule has three distinct regions. This orange region, which is the coding region that is used to generate the protein, and then an upstream and a downstream region, which are used by the cell to regulate how much of this, how long this molecule is allowed to uh, be in the cell. So the most important part of this molecule is this middle part, um, which codes for the protein. And what I wanted to know, is the information content of this region more complex than the upstream or the downstream sections? And that's a big data problem because there's 30,000 of those sequences in a well-known database. Um, so what I did was I, to assess complexity, I calculated the Shannon entropy of each 21 nucleotide segment from each of those mRNA molecules from the database and group the region, group by region and compare. So kind of to walk you through the map and reduce operations, first I mapped all of the 21 nucleotide um, segments of all 30,000 of those uh, um, molecules to va the value one and then reduced it simply to, redu to uh, did a reduce operation to remove the duplicates. Then I, and as I did this, I carried through which region it came from, whether it was that middle coding region or the upstream or the downstream region. I then mapped the Shannon entropy of each of those nucleotide segments to the region that uh, they came from. And then finally did a reduce operation over here to create a box plot out of, out of by, by region. And uh, what's cool about this 
is because this is Python, the reduce operation could create a matplotlib class instead of just a number. So that was the coolest thing I found in this whole process. Um, and this is my output. It, uh, these are the, this is from the coding region, the center region, and slightly higher complexity than the uh, downstream and the upstream region. Um, so what MapReduce gave me there is that it took the computation job down from an hour to 10 minutes. Um, since really I could have waited an hour for this data, it's kind of academic. But li like the choice of the Bayesian methods that you asked about, I did this this way to see if I could do it. Um, so then I have two uh, non-biological analyses we conducted in Python that I'd like to share. Um, first is we did a customer survey, and I clustered the survey responses to uh, using um, cluster.hierarchy um, to figure out how they group so we could decide whether the, if the products we think they want are relevant to what our customers say they want. And you know, once I had defined the similarity matrix, it only took three lines of code to get this. So that's pretty sweet. And then a personal favorite. Um, Network X was mentioned a lot t today and yesterday, so I had to include this slide. Um, each of the employees in our R&D group uh, took the Myers-Briggs type indicator. <laughs> and uh, basically, and of course, obviously, Bullwinkle and Homer don't work for life tech. I changed the names to protect people. Um, but the, these nodes are each a Myers-Briggs indicator type, and uh, the lines in, are weighted by how many letters in common. So the blue lines, Nate and Natasha, have three of these symbols in common, whereas the light blue lines indicate two in common, and the uh, yellow lines, one in common. And uh, this was done very quickly with, uh, you can set up the graph and plot it in very few lines of code. Um, we used that to troubleshoot all our R&D problems. Um, last, I'd like to talk about Django. Um, so in a perfect world, everybody would interact with their data through IPython. I, I, I just have given up that dream because I don't think it's going to actually happen, but that would be ideal. But most people consume data through a web browser, so I kind of came to the conclusion that being able to make web applications is a vital data scientist skill. Um, and uh, we use Django to do that. So Django, this is an example of a LIMS we're building um, that has a jQuery front end, but on the server side, it's, it's Django, so it's Python code where you define a business object as a class, and Django automatically creates and manages the database uh, relationships in the class, or, or corresponding to the class. Um, Django is basically gives you the model view controller paradigm in a really, really easy to work with way. Here, here's another one. Um, this is a database of our tissues that needed, so we have a bunch of tissues from different uh, samples and we needed to know what, uh, what they were. So I created a tool that you can just filter by species or tissue or whatever and get a list of all the samples that are available in the freezer. Um, and again, the database kind of takes care of a lot of this for you. So this business object here, this block, is covered by this class. And you'll notice that the foreign key relationships are to like species or tissue are also Python classes. And again, Django takes care of the foreign key relationships in the underlying database. So last thing is we're looking for bioinformatics collaboration. So if anybody has any interesting projects or ideas, let me know. Um, thanks.